Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, your Excellency, Excellencies, welcome to this next panel. And I will ask you please to um, take your seats and uh, perhaps we can get going with this next session. Um, I would like to welcome Your Excellency to this next session, and other, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with me here. Now, um, it's my pleasure here to moderate a session with two very distinguished guests. We have to my left, Wim Pibus, who is the um, director, uh, general director of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, which I'm sure most of you visited. And further down along the, uh, the panel, we have Georgia Abeltino, who is director of public policy uh, at the Google Cultural Institute, which some of you may know is a Google educational site offering virtual tours of roughly 1,000 museums and cultural institutions around the world. Now, um, the one thing that I wanted to pass on is that unfortunately Georgia has a slight voice problem this morning, so, um, but I think it's getting better. So if her <laughs> voice is slightly faint, I hope you will forgive us. Um, it's called nature. And uh, so I, I just thought I'd got, get this conversation started by sharing a statistic with you um, that I got from the UN World Tourism Organization. And the statistic is the following, that in 1950, international tourist arrivals around the world, which means overnight stays in a country of destination, totaled 25 million everywhere in the world, all put together. And guess what, in, 90, uh, sorry, in 2015, last year, they reached an all-time record of 1.18 billion. So the explosion in world tourism, which all of you have witnessed and all of you have contributed to, is absolutely phenomenal. And with mass tourism showing absolutely no signs of slowing in the World Tourism Organization, you know, the, the charts, the arrows keep moving up, this um, trend is not about to slow down. The world's great museums and cultural sites, as Vim, I'm sure, can tell you, are experiencing wear and tear. About a year ago, at this time, I had the good fortune of visiting the director of the Vatican Museums, Antonio Paolucci, who um, previously led the Museums of Florence. So he's very, very familiar with issues of heritage, frescoes, fragility. And, you know, he said that because the chapel is one of the holiest sites in Christendom, um, but that it's also the world's greatest art history manual, I mean, where else could you find so much of art history in genuine form, in one place, it was actually deluged with visitors. And what happens with visitors is that they exhale, they sweat, I mean, we're human beings. They bring in dust, and so what happens to the frescoes over a long period of time is damage. Um, I think the Vatican did some studies and they discovered that there were some areas of, of a painted wall of the Sistine Chapel that were actually damaged by human carbon dioxide exhalation. So he said to me, soon there's gonna be six million visitors to the Sistine Chapel, to the Vatican Museums. When that happens, I'm going to say, basta. And he actually used the word, Basta. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, I'm sure you will. And I said, how are you going to do that? How are you going to say basta? And he said, everybody's going to have to book online. There will be days when the Sistine Chapel will be sold out. And so here on our panel today, we have uh, the director of a museum whose visitors' numbers may not quite match the Sistine Chapels, but, you know, the Rijksmuseum has close to two and a half million visitors a year, if I'm not mistaken, Bim. And that's not exactly, you know, anything to be embarrassed about. That's not a small number. So, Vim, I just wanted to ask you with this onslaught of mass tourism, will the museums of tomorrow be virtual, digital? That, you know, will people still be able to go into your buildings? Um, no, I don't think so. The museum is the place, and I think maybe in the future the only place in the world where real authenticity can be enjoyed. So, and that's what museums are about. At the same time, we, we have the, to cope the challenge of growth in mass tourism, uh, growing every year five, six percent. So, indeed, that's a challenge. So, the Vatican, Venice, the Uffizi, 
but also the Rijksmuseum at certain points is, is well, is booked out, it's sold out, like a concert, like the performing arts. So I think that in the future, there's still room for, for growth for all museums, even the Vatican. But we have to spread this interest in, in tourism by e-ticketing or dynamic pricing or other kind of, of tools. Uh, and at the same time, we have to unlock our collections, our treasures, thanks to the web. Uh, we discuss that later in this, in this panel, I guess. And I think the, the web with the, the, the state of technology, the, the, the connectivity of the web worldwide, that really is a, a great tool for the future for museums. The open access, the creative tool that the internet supplies us, I think that is the ideal partner for the museum. And at the same time, the museum can never be replaced by a virtual whatever. Why not, Wim? Why can the museum never be replaced? Because I, I, I'm a museum director and I think, and I'm convinced that, that the real object and the real experience is always the best you can get. Um, I mean, you can Skype and you can FaceTime with your partner or whatever, but a real dinner with candlelight is, is unbeatable. So uh, that is what it's about, the authenticity, the real experience, the real face-to-face -to, -face to a person or to an object, to the Mona Lisa or the Night Watch or whatever, that is what it's about. And back home, you always can study it or you can uh, look it up in a catalog or on a website or whatever. But the real, real authentic experience that's unbeatable and that's the museum. And do you think that you'll be able to, you know, looking 20 years from now, 50 years from now, given these world tourism numbers, you're going to be able to allow people continually to come in and see the Night Watch? Yeah, well, to a certain extent. It's Rembrandt, by the way. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, I mean, to a certain extent, it, uh, if it's full, it's full. I mean, you have regulations, you have fire regulations, you have safety yeah. control, and of course you have, well, if it's packed, then it's packed, then it's full. So at a certain time, it's, it's too crowded. So then you have to say, okay, we can stretch the opening hours in, in the evening, but the Rijksmuseum already is open. 365 days a year. That's, uh, openness is also our key word. We are open, the collection is open, the building is open, the attitude of the people is open, and we want to be open as much as possible. Nine to five every day, but also we can extend it in the evening hours, so there's room for growth. Um, and at the same time, the peak hours, as in many museums, is in, the, is in holiday seasons, summer seasons, Christmas times, but in, let's say, in March or in September or in November, there is still room for, uh, for more. And yeah, but if we look 50 years from now, 100 years from now, I mean, it's very difficult for us to see that far, but... Um, yeah, well, 50 years from now, that's, 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 that's a very long step, but I think um, there, there's room for growth still. And, and, and I think, um, yeah, sometimes it might be sold out, like, like a concert, like a theater play. So, yeah, the first to come, the first you have the chance to get a ticket. Great. Georgia, I don't know how your voice is doing, but... Um, we will try. <laughs> <coughs> um, so, basically, Google, uh, which you work for, has created this nonprofit called the Cultural Institute, and um, via this online tool, you're offering visitors, uh, or well, online visitors, or computer users, uh, the chance to visit, you know, click their way down the ramp of the Guggenheim Museum, go through the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Um, are you trying to, you know, take over museums? Are you trying to put this man out of business? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Can you, can you hear me if I speak this way? Yes. No. <laughs> Perhaps it's better if I speak this way. So first of all, I apologize for my voice. I had a fight with the air conditioning, and the air conditioning won, definitely. Yeah. So uh, I will do my best. So I, I have to agree with you that having a dinner with someone and having a look at the starry nights is definitely much more interesting than just looking at it online. But the point is, I think, another one. The point is really providing access to culture to everybody in the world. And it's the point of democratizing access to culture. We have to think that not everybody will be uh, available or will be able to go to the 16th chapel. But actually, digital can be a tool. And so I think that when art meets technology, incredible things can happen. So what is the cultural institute at Google? What are we trying to do? 
of the world on the one hand, and on the other, we really wanted to partner with museums, with cultural institutions, to develop presence online and to make the best of the digital opportunities. So today, after five years, we have partnership with 1,000 museums and archives. And if you go on the digital uh, platform of the Cultural Institute, you will find a lot. So try to go to the app Arts and Culture and you will see that it's a journey into history, art and culture. And what is the point? The point here is that not really to talk to art expert, but to talk to anybody. Internet is going to anybody and everybody can be interested or curious about culture. So the Google Cultural Institute is trying together with the institutions, together with the museum, to take the citizen by hand and bringing him into a journey through culture, through art and through history. And so I think that the power of technology is not that you're looking at the starry nights. This is something that you cannot replace, but you can have other immersive experience. Yeah. You can look at images with the highest possible resolution. Yeah, yeah, sure. It is something that you cannot yeah. do. Or you can have an immersive experience using virtual reality. And it's another journey. It's a yeah, different yeah, journey. Yeah. But it's something that complements, if you want, the physical experience. Yeah, yeah. And I strongly agree with them that the cultural experience does not have to start when you get into the museum and to finish, when you go out from the museum, is start is something that starts before. Yeah, so it's it's a basically a complementary tool. Um, Vim, I was going to ask you some a question, and then I will open it up to to the floor because I think we have very little time. Um, the previous panel referred to the destruction that has taken place in places like Palmyra. Um, and not just Palmyra. And uh, there's a particular case, as you know, of images of militants smashing up artworks at the Mosul Museum. And this led a, a, a group of uh, young uh, Western archaeologists to start something called Project Mosul, where they took stills of the um, artworks that were smashed up um, in Mosul, pre-existing stills, and, and they said they kind of crowdsourced it, they put out an appeal, anyone who has pictures of these works in Mosul, can we please have them because we are trying to recreate the museum virtually? And that's exactly what they ended up doing. They got the stills and then they kind of using 3D technology, they kind of created a kind of 3D museum, obviously only a virtual one. And I mean, so don't you think that this, perhaps this virtual tool that Georgia works with, um, has uh, some pretty essential roles to play going forward. Yeah, I, I think this is a dramatic example what you're what you're mentioning. Yeah. And of course, it is um, if if it's completely destroyed, then I think a 3D replica of what it was, it's it's maybe a good uh, substitute or alternative, though it will never really replace the original. How sad it is. So. Uh, but it's more than nothing. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that people do and take these initiatives and, and, and replace uh, world heritage uh, via this, this, this way. But, but at the same time, it's a sad conclusion that it will never replace the real thing. Yeah, because your idea is that, I mean, I was speaking to Vem before and he was saying, even if something is 3D, hologram, full size, full color, of a great masterpiece is never going to be the same as the real thing. And I have to say that I'm, the, I'm a museum director, so <laughs> <laughs> that's, but we agree as well. I mean, we, we, we team up with Google and we did great projects. And even, even the Nightwatch that has, been, that has been photographed thanks to the Google Earth project. I mean, you really can see details that even my, my most esteemed curators never saw before. They really can zoom in on every, every specific detail. So, one of the guys came into my office and said, Wim, I, I've seen something that I've never seen before. But it, of course, has always been there, has been painted by Rembrandt in the 17th century. But thanks to this Google technique, it was, it, was, it surfaced for the, for the, funny enough, for the, for the first time. So indeed, Google is very important to unlock 
collections. Uh, and what we do with the, with the Rijksmuseum, with our website, we bring it one step further. We unlock it, so you can search it, but you can also play with it. It's free, it's free for copyrights, it's no restrictions, and you can make, and that's completely new, and well, <laughs> Rijksmuseum is one of the leading museums in the cultural, in, in, the, in the visual domain of, of, of the web, that you can make your own collection. It's about ownership. Who is in charge of making choices of what is important in that collection? So you can select your own uh, museum, so to say. And you can not only select on Rembrandt or Vermeer or Van Gogh, you can also select on Blue Eyes or Bread or Amsterdam or any, any search word that you like. And then via this enormous search engine, this whole collection of the Rijksmuseum is, is reorganized, but you do it, you're in charge. And this, this is exactly what the internet uh, stimulates, this whole DIY, this do it yourself. So it's not the top down curator, museum director who says, this is the best, this is what you have to see. You can do it yourself. And that is a complete disruptive, game changing element that the internet gives us. And we, we embrace it in the Rijksmuseum, so we do it. And that's, that is something completely new. And it gives new ways of, 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 of engaging with our collection. And if, right. if you allow me, yes, please. If you allow me to say something, first of all, you invited the most forward looking museum and the director of museum. But I think that this point is very important that now with big data, the user, the citizen, the visitor, as you want to call it, is really in power. It's, it's possible with Rick's Museum, but in the future, uh, people, me and you, will be able to search about red in Renaissance, the color red, red in Renaissance. In Renaissance yeah. And we will have all the paintings that have red in the Renaissance period. And so it's really the, the citizen or the visitor that is leading his journey. It's a different way. Yeah. It's about who is in charge of this journey and what I want to discover. Yeah. And it's a different approach to art. I think it's time for me to turn to you and see if there are already any questions in the room. I see a, a hand, Lisa Schiff. Hi. Um, this question, oh, thank you. This is for Vim. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering what you think about the notion of unlocking local cultural patrimony to a kind of global cultural patrimony like the Guggenheim style where you're actually physically sending our orcs to different locations? We also sent our physical works to different collections, also to the MIA here in Doha. We had a great exhibition on uh, Golden Age, including Vermeer and, uh, and Rembrandt. And we, last year, 2015, we sent about 1,000 loans to 168 museums worldwide. So the Rijksmuseum, as many of the major big museums in the world, we are permanently uh, lending exhibitions or giving loans to uh, places all over the world. And since this world is more and more a global uh, field, we also send them not only to the US and Europe, but also to Brazil, uh, to the Middle East, to Australia, to Southeast Asia, even to Africa, where now also is, uh, is a scene of museums coming up. Uh, I'm in the advisory board of, of the new museum in Cape Town. So there, there is a complete new field of museums coming up. And yes, the museums in the West, they are willing to participate and to lend the real works of art, to participate and to, to share with the world. I think we have another question. Uh, hi, Mark Spiegler from Art Basel. I've, uh, hi. There's always this old school notion that the digital re will, will replace the physical, but actually I think if you look at every industry, the digital actually drives people towards the physical. And I'm curious what the experience is of Vim or of Georgia with the thousand museums that she works with. Do you have metrics on how actually, in the same way that social media for music has actually, for bands has actually driven people towards live concerts, do you find that the presence of, of having works online drives people towards museums? So, what we saw is definitely what you say, so that once you experience something online, then definitely you want to go there. If you see something, then you want to experience that something. So, there is a direct relation between the digital experience 
and then the physical experience. We are gathering data because, of course, the data are in the hands of the of the museums. But there is the example of the Versailles. Versailles was one of the first who developed, let's say, its presence on the Google Cultural Institute, and they saw an exponential growth of their digital engagement with people. But they also saw an increase in their in their physical visitors. This is particularly important for small and medium museum, because for for the uh, for the Vatican, perhaps it doesn't make that difference. But let me give you an example of the Hamburg Archaeological Museum. From the moment he went online on the Cultural Institute, he had three times the visitors, the physical visitors, getting there. Because people started discovering the Hamburg Archaeological Museum and nobody knew it. So of course it depends, but definitely the answer is positive. Vim, um, if I may, I was going to step in and ask you something very uh, concrete. Um, have you actually um, seen or observed or been told about damage that has been done to your collections because of too many visitors, too many physical human visitors? No. No? Okay, that's encouraging. Another question we have here. Hi, this is Koraidaman. I just have a quick question. You said that people will be able to research red in Renaissance and see all the paintings. Who decides to put those tags to those uh, paintings? Is it the users or Google and the museums? Because there's still this notionship of authorship, right? Because what is read for you might not be read for me. So how do you think about it in Google? Like who tags these descriptions to these uh, collections? You're completely right. So in the future, the most amazing experience would be in the big data world to connect everything, to connect all the art pieces and to create links among them. But it's important to tag this, this of course, the, the basic is to tag these images. And it's up to the curator, so it's up to the museum that has the knowledge to tag and to say this is a Rembrandt, it has red, it belongs yeah. to this period, etc., etc. So it's a big work that Google is doing with the institutions, so with the museum, to be sure that any image is tagged in the right way. So when I ask for something, I have the right response. It's also true that, that with machine learning, all this will improve because machine learning will be able to detect red or blue and, 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 and provide you with, uh, with a good answer. But to answer to your question is up to the museum. Yeah. yeah you're right. To, to we already do that. It's the wisdom of the crowd. So the whole, the whole idea of, well, everybody knows Wikipedia. So everybody can add to, to objects from the collection his or her remarks. So if there is a tree with some birds in it and we don't know uh, the name of all the birds, we, we, uh, we ask uh, biologists or people who are specialists in birds, what, is, what, what kind of birds are that? And people can add that. So this whole wisdom of the crowds idea, this, this phenomenon of, of Wikipedia is also added to our websites. And that gives a complete new of, of new data and that, and that is enriching our collection. But of course there is a, a committee of curators, uh, a kind of editorial board who's deciding what is, what is and what not uh, correct or sufficient or uh, relevant. Do we have any other questions from the floor? <coughs> I don't see any. Um, George, I was going to ask you, uh, Google has alienated very much uh, parts of the publishing business by creating Google Books and digitizing, well, they hope to digitize every book that was ever printed. Um, are you getting this same you know, kind of favorable feedback and reaction from museum directors as you're getting from them or well the fact that we are at the fact that we are at 1000 partners we have 1000 partners give you the answer and i think that the key here is that we are working with the partner when we digitize uh, the the paintings or the art pieces then the, we give the copyright back the copyright is in the hands 
of the of the of the content owner so of the museum so it's uh, uh, it's it has always been a very good relation for all this reason and is a real partnership yeah i mean i don't know if any of you've gone on the google cultural institute site or on other museum sites and mouse clicked your way around these museums the tool is i mean obviously we all want to reproduce the real experience of being there which is kind of almost impossible well impossible but we want to get as close as possible and we're not really there yet i mean the mouse clicking you know i tried to kind of go through the rooms of whatever museum it was but it's still you're getting basically still images and you're working through them but it's not like really it's walking it's through coming. It's, coming. it's coming so can you tell us a little bit um, we've only got a minute and a half you know how it's coming what what uh, well we we're, we're busy also with Google to have this whole navigation thing so you can really go and then one step further is with this virtual reality glasses you 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 can as if you imagine you're in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam you navigate through the galleries and really see the latest hanging and the combination and whatsoever though it's always still not the real thing it's another real thing it's the virtual world so it's 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 something next to uh, next to the real museum but i'm 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 happy that these these technology is is available and it's it might lose something in the margin but i'm sure that we win in the volume because the whole internet is global so as soon as and coming back on the question of mark spiegler we 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 lost indeed some maybe something in, in the in the margin but we lo we we won enormously in the volume so I'm sure that the, that the Rijksmuseum is now available, let's say, in China. We are in Weibo. We have visitors from Brazil and all over the world and all at the same time. So you see this number of visitors or users to the website. It's, it's going up, up, up every time and it's doubling more quicker and quicker. So yeah, who's against that? I mean, people are interested in art. They love it. They come to the Google Art Project, they go visit the, the Louvre or the Rijksmuseum or whatever. So I think it's good. I think it's very good to end on that optimistic note. Thank you very much to my guests, uh, Wim Pibus of Rijksmuseum. <laughs> Thank you.